Okay, so uh, let's continue. Um, next up is Frederik Weidemann from VirtualForge, and he's speaking about hacking and securing SAP HANA applications from a penetration point, tester's point of view. Thank you. Please give him a warm welcome. So, <laughs> hi everybody. So, um, thank you for the introduction. So, I've been doing penetration testing uh, in the SAP environment for about uh, 12 years now. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, HANA was presented by SAP, so we are also starting investigating that. And um, we today just want to share the experience in terms of what we have seen during code reviews and also what is possible uh, within custom applications that are written on top of HANA. Um, before we start, maybe a short question. Uh, whom of you is a penetration tester guy? Okay. So whom of you is SAP basis or has HANA basis experience, who is a HANA developer? No one at all? Okay, so let's get started. The usual disclaimer, short overview. So I have a lot of content. Um, uh, let's see uh, how much time we can have within the questions sections where we could then also elaborate uh, on various topics. Uh, HANA itself is, is, is a huge application and therefore there, there's also a, a lot of topics uh, you could talk about. So um, these are just some of them and I'm going to show you them now. So before we start, let's have a short overview about um, the HANA platform, uh, also from an architecture point of view, how it is typically uh, deployed with every SAP application and everyone who is Uh, already running on the NetViva platform. We have typically a three-tier architecture, development system, Q&A system, production system. So what you could do on one side is just get rid of your Oracle DB2 whatsoever database running beneath your NetViva stack and just exchange it uh, with HANA. So that's one possibility. Second possibility is you can run HANA standalone. Then you're running the database and it includes an own application server and you can develop, of course, on top of that and you can mix up both things. And then, of course, you can do everything on premise and you can also put it into the cloud. And let's see where in the future we will go. So that's a short overview about all the processes uh, that will run on a HANA system. It's just to give you an overview. Uh, everyone who has already installed a NetViva ABAP system, as an example, already knows there are quite some ports that are being opened. It's the same way with the HANA system. Um, and especially with the XS Advanced Engine, it will be that every application you are running, depending on how you configure it, but in, in the standard configuration, will use its own port. Um, those of you who know the index server might see that uh, HANA has a background from, from T-Rex. So I think that's the history from where it evolved. Looking at the custom code and the application development, uh, we basically need to distinguish between the, let's say, HANA 1.0 platform using XSJS classic model um, here within the application development, we have server-side XSJS, JavaScript, and you can run secret script. On top of that, you have also client libraries, and you have the ZAP UI5 framework, which you can use uh, to access those back-end applications. Of course, you do have JDBC and all that kind of stuff. If you go for HANA 2.0, and it was already introduced in HANA uh, 1.0, but uh, It's now, let's say, uh, the standard way, which is XS Advanced, um, the corresponding engine. Then you have the possibilities also to run Node.js, Java, and basically also to embed any custom language and runtime. Um, I'm not sure how well this is supported or not, um, because currently what I at least read is that it's not supported. However, it's listed on, on, on the feature list. So let's see where this will go. And also in terms of possibilities, um, what could happen or what could go wrong. So um, I'm quite looking forward to the next ticket, what kind of features uh, will be presented, because the amount of uh, complexity 
uh, that came in going from XSJS and going then to XS Advanced is, is quite high and also takes a little bit of understanding and, and all the history to, to get the full picture. So this is just an overview slide um, from uh, SAP uh, itself, or it's basically uh, from HelpSubcom. Uh, for those of you who have no clue yet about the HANA platform, um, you get a lot of things out of the box, and from my perspective, it has been also developed uh, with a security mindset. So you get SSL, you get data volume encryption, you have roles, you have authentication, all those kinds of things are, are basically available out of the box. And of course, then it will depend on how you configure it and how you run it. So that was the very short introduction. Uh, let's look at uh, the uh, security settings you can have. And for that first, we want to look at the authorizations. Again, that's a very short uh, introduction. So there are various kind of privileges. And this is not working. OK. So there are various kind of privileges um, you can have. And uh, basically, the idea is that you have someone who is creating roles. That one is doing this during the design time. Then you somehow activate it. And then during runtime, a user administrator is assigning these roles uh, to users. Um, that's the kind of concept you can also, during, let's say, runtime, dynamically create new roles. But then you're the only one who can grant those roles to other users. And that's something you should not use. And it's everywhere written that you should not use it. Um, from an application developer's perspective, um, you have the possibility that with every application, uh, you can also assign authorizations and create new authorizations. So um, this is uh, one example of our test package uh, where you can configure it and you can assign um, different privileges to it. Looking at the details, um, every XS application uh, will contain at least one .xs access file. And within that .xs access file, you get the interesting settings. So on one hand, we have exposed true, which means that this is remotely callable. And this will basically be valid for everything within the same package. And then we have authentication. Um, you can look for method form. Then you need to authenticate. Otherwise, you cannot. Um, access the application, or if you use authentication null, uh, then you can connect anonymously. Subsequently, you can also assign authorizations. Um, you can create rewrite rules uh, so um, to beautify uh, corresponding entries, as an example. You can enforce the usage of SSL. You can enforce um, or uh, enforce uh, how should I say properly? Uh, you can configure what we would see also later on, uh, an, an out-of-the-box XSRF protection, and um, by just turning it to true. Then we have two different database connections, anonymous connection and default connection. So if you have an anonymous application, somehow you need to access the database. And the corresponding user or technical user is then defined in the anonymous connection. If you have authorized users, then you can define a default connection, and um, that's the corresponding file. But I'm not going to elaborate on that. In the same way, you can also define custom headers, like this, so to make your application sure, uh, secure against certain type of web attacks. And that gives you a first overview about the responsibilities that a developer has. So I, as the developer, not only develop code, I also need to take care about the authorizations. And it might be that I also need to take care about the security settings. So this is thinking about DevOps. It's all mixing to, uh, together. In the past, in the ABAP world, for me, it was like you have someone who is doing basis. You will still have that guy. You have someone who is doing all the roles and authorizations. And then you have someone who is the developer. And here, you have the case that the developer, at least for this part, is taking over all three roles. 
So let's dive into the possibilities and uh, the technologies you have. Uh, one of the nice things is um, that you can easily expose any, any table via OData. So all you need to do is you need to define an XSO data file um, which contains basically service and then you have either uh, a schema or in this case um, a table and you define it uh, here it is Trooper's demo customer as customers and that's it and then it's exposed and basically by just performing if you have the corresponding .xs access file you can directly access it. You can as OData by default also allows you to perform um, modifications. You can again limit these down, so you can say create, update, delete is forbidden. So if we do this, um, then you can just directly go to the URL, you can access it and then you have the full features of OData. So um, you can use dollar metadata or whatsoever. We see here customers, then we can uh, append a slash for customers and then we can crawl through the ideas. Or we can list everything. There have been talks on Black Hat. Um, I, I think already in 2012 talking about OData, so I don't want to elaborate on that. Um, I think it's still important because Zap UI 5 is heavily uh, using it, so that's a front-end uh, technology. Um, and I see more and more services uh, using this. I see also the challenge that more and more developers within SAP systems are trying to set up stateful applications using OData, even though that is initially a stateless REST service. So that brings in some challenges for the developers to, to think about all the necessary constraints. So what we've seen, it's super easy. So this will take you, if you have basically access to your web environment and you just know, okay, I need to apply the file, but it takes you one minute and then you have your all data service ready. So that's, that's quite nice. From a penetration tester's point of view, Everything is exposed and I have a quite nice interface and I can sort the data. You can also set up any backend input validation and, and, and stuff like that. But from a penetration tester's point of view, I can easily crawl the data and pull out all the data. And then it's really the question about the authorizations and how the application is behaving, whether that's an issue and how critical it is. So take care about authentication and authorizations. So let's go for a classical one, which is cross-site scripting. So for cross-site scripting, I do have a, a short demo application, uh, which, which we can use. Um, uh, so first, let's just talk about XSJS. From my perspective, XSJS is meant to provide data via JSON. Uh, you can write your backend logic. You could also abuse it to write dynamic HTML pages. So you can do that going for the um, XS advanced engine. You can also see that then it's also a possibility to directly deploy HTML5 applications. Um, and in the same way, if you create dynamically HTML pages, then of course it's quite easy. You just uh, include any sort of input, you forget about the encoding, and then you will end up with cross-site scripting in all its flavors. So, let's see.
So that's basically just an example application which we created which uh, uses WI5 and we have some backend services. Uh, and with these we can uh, play around and, and make various demonstrations and um, then we can also look at the code, uh, what is the root cause for the corresponding uh, content. So in this case, so sorry for the zoom now, I'm, I'm looking for cross-site scripting. Um, I can also now say, let's just provide here any sort of user input. Uh, we can execute it and then we have the classical alert cross-site scripting. So that is one example. Um, and let's go for the second one. Okay, too many browsers windows open. If not, I'm going to switch to the slides. So now the VPN is low, hooray. Now the VPN is like really slow. Okay. So let's just go back to the slides and maybe in a couple of seconds it will run better. Okay, so that's a cross-site scripting uh, we have been seeing in the same way. Um, I hope that's sufficient in the back. If not, uh, I can zoom in. So that's a cl classical one. So using XSJS, I can just create a random HTML page. I can collect a get parameter. I can embed it into the page, uh, and then I, I will end up with any sort of cross-site scripting. Um, going back to this example, so this is something that should normally not help, uh, not occur, because the sub UI5 framework already takes care about the necessary encoding. So earlier we heard from Onapsis um, that it's also about the developers and the juniors and how well they understand all the technologies and the frameworks and what they are used to use for development and whether they have, as an example, a PHP background. So um, you can, of course, always avoid the existing frameworks and build everything on your own, and then you will, of course, mess it up. So that's the same what happens here or what, what happened uh, within the sub UI5. Um, so basically, you just need to have a backend service where you manually build up your, your JSONs, and then in the same way you can have, of course, there also uh, then cross-site scripting, and the recommendation, of course, would be to rely uh, on the UI5 controls. So for XSJS, I'm not aware about any encoding function uh, for HTML encoding, so you just have the encode URI function. So, but I mean, from my perspective, don't create dynamic HTML pages using XSJS. So that's not the idea how it's meant to be used. So let's go for cross-site request forgery. So in the XS access uh, file, I mentioned the prevent XSRF or CSRF uh, true configuration parameter. So what is this uh, doing? So let's assume we have just a static uh, page. So this is just an, an example of, of, of a simple HTML page who is doing a post request against uh, simple.xsjs, this one here. So then we can just call it, then we can enter some data, we push submit, and then we end up with a 403. So 
So one remark here, you get no information about that the cross-site request forgery token uh, is missing. So this is how it behaves. And then um, in the same way, of course, we can look on protocol level and uh, here we get uh, the information and within the header, and this is something, of course, you could also evaluate then, um, we get the required information. So how to do it on code level? And maybe now it's better to zoom in. So um, that's an example HTML page. And what we will do first, if we enable the prevent XSRF protection, um, then we will first Great, so now the pointer is not going anymore. Okay, let's do it like this. So I'm quite tall. So we are in this line. So there we said, uh, please uh, obtain an X, uh, CSRF token. Uh, then it will uh, send it out. And then later on, if we post a submit to the simple XSJS, we can send out the token. The token will be automatically generated uh, by the framework. It will be automatically validated. And then we are good to go, So, which we can see on the right side here. So first, um, we get the fetch. Then we get the answer. And in the same way, then we are performing the post. And then it's accepted. So this is how it works. So what's the challenge? Again, for the developer, talking about web services, you should not do any modifications using GET requests. So the framework itself will protect you, but it will only be for POST and the other verbs. It will not be for GET. So for GET, and this is also something you need to take care about when you do code review. If someone is basically doing uh, something like um, collecting the input still via GET, then this application will be vulnerable to cross-site request forgery, even though that you send prevent XSRF to true. What you could also do is, in this case, uh, you can make, again, uh, a check for the HTTP verb. But um, yeah, then you're basically doing it again on your own. And I think that's not the idea. <coughs> so which brings us to the next topic, which is uh, SQL injection. So again, we have an example for SQL injection, where we will basically, in the background, perform this query. So that for the sake of simplicity, I just now provide the expected user input. I can execute the code. And then I have a constraint in the back end where I just say on this table there's a customer ID or like a company code, uh, Buchungskreis, whatsoever, and then it's, it is limiting it down. So in the same way, I can now also say just do the one um, one or equals one trick. And then we will end up with all the data being uh, exposed to the user. <coughs> so let's continue. So that's the example we have just been seeing. So you get it also in the slides. Um, we do have some variations on that topic. So you can have a standard SQL injection, 
Um, then we have the uh, attack input in this case. And please note, so no apostrophes whatsoever. So that's the way how you can go. And this is how you also write it within the URL if you have a GET request as an example. And of course, uh, the mitigation would be uh, we use uh, prepared statements. So that's an example. Um, but what I've seen, I think this was already in the first year when I started doing penetration testing. Um, with prepared statements, of course, you can also have prepared statement injections. So this will also work. And then again, you are screwed. Then on top of that, you have also the possibility to run SQL script. So you can use SQL script also as, as an extra filter function for input validation on exposed OData services, as an example. And SQL script itself also provides the possibility to um, execute dynamic SQL script using execute immediate or using exec. And in that case, um, beforehand we were kind of limited into the where condition and, and so far I found no way of using union and that kind of stuff because you need to be on table level so that you can do those uh, joins. Um, but in this case, uh, we have basically a generic table reader which you could also write up. So how critical is this? Well. As we have seen in the previous talk, it's really dependent on the kind of authorizations. So I think from an from a, a academic point of view, it's an interesting example. However, in reality, the user who is calling this procedure then also need dedicated authorizations to be allowed to execute this procedure. So it's unlikely that someone well, except for the case, oh, application is not running and let's just assign all authorizations and then maybe it works. So unless you have that kind of situation um, where from my perspective, anyhow, everything will fail, um, everything related to SQL injection is limited by authorizations. And then of course, again, it's the question on what kind of authorizations does in an anonymous context the user have? So for, um, for the previous talk, what we have seen, we have very interesting and high, privilege, high privileges. If you write your own application, I would expect that you have only privileges in that corresponding context. And then you might have a SQL injection where a penetration tester would say, yeah, great, we have a SQL injection, but in terms of exploitability, it's not so great because you're really limited to where you are and it depends on the application logic. So just, uh, just as an example here, um, we can provide input there. So this is just running the SQL console as a demo. And uh, of course, then we get the corresponding output. For SQL script, it's a little bit different. Um, so if we use dynamic SQL script, um, then the answer to it is, again, escaping. So and then it depends on how you build your string. Um, whether you need uh, escape single quotes, whether you need escape double quotes. Um, there's also this uh, is SQL injection uh, safe? And it will evaluate the amount of tokens within the SQL string and then you can count the number to, to is this matching up to the number you are expecting? But again, <laughs> I don't know. what. Let's just say for the escape SQL quotes, uh, escape double quotes, I feel quite safe that you can use it in the right way. For the SQL injection safe, you could also use it, but it depends on really what your SQL string is. And if you just need to change the Boolean logic, then the amount of tokens won't change. OK, and you can always play around, which is a nice feature, using the dummy table. And then you can get your own feedback while developing. OK, um, so that's again the remark uh, regarding the authorizations. And that's also interesting for the part of blind SQL injection, because if you do have a blind SQL injection, uh, you will first get errors. And then it might be that you end up somewhere where you get the information. Now the exception is you have insufficient privileges. 
then you know you have the right string, but you're not authorized. So you cannot exploit it. So, which brings us to code injection. So there we have two examples which have been found within the SAP standard uh, by the guys uh, from Onapsis. And um, so in the default, it should not be possible to use eval somehow. So the web IDE, web IDE which is the uh, web development environment uh, running in a browser, um, automatically makes JS lint tags. And if you try to somehow use eval, you will get the information best practice. Eval can be harmful. So, but in the same way, if you just look for the corresponding error messages, uh, you will also find uh, ESLint. And there it's described basically what it is checking and what it's not checking, when it works and when it doesn't work. So, I mean, it's like with a gun. If you want to shoot yourself in the foot, then you can do this and you will end up with XSJS injection. So the things uh, that were found in the standard were just, um, I don't know, um, related to directly evil. Um, I'm not expecting lots of findings in that direction, but I can surely recommend to perform a search for eval still anyhow, because it is possible. So it's not like the case, it's impossible. And then we can just um, create a dynamic large string. So we have now two user inputs which are being rendered into, into the page. And here we just create a new get connection. We, we build a new query. We select the data. And then we just basically um, select new data uh, from a database table. And the output is here rendered uh, into input field one. And here it is just collecting uh, our company name. Again, this is also dependent on the authorization. So where is the user having access to or not? And in the same way, if you think about XSJS code injection, um, and if you have somehow an ABAP background, then you think, oh, that's the worst case scenario that could possibly happen. So code injection is always a bad thing. So then it's interesting to look at the API, what XSJS is offering, or what it isn't is offering. And um, from that perspective, I can say we are, we are on a better side than we are on the application server um, ABAP. Because directory traversal and OS command injection should not be possible. I'm saying should because in the past, of course, um, I think that was the example using R, which you could still abuse. So that, that was a vulnerability within the standard. But the API itself should not offer any possibility for, for executing operating system commands. And in the same way, you do not have any file I.O. access. So you should not be able to access uh, files. However, again, in the same way, like the people were searching for, uh, how can I deal with the situation? One of the funny answers I found, um, so that was on, on one of the SAP forums, was, uh, OK, if you want to expose some files, then set up a local web server, and then you can use an HTTP destination and then expose the files that way. So you can make outgoing calls um, in XSJS, but it's not possible to directly access the, well, it should not be possible. Let's just say it in that way. OK. Which brings us um, to XS Advanced. So that's the successor of the XS engine. So it's polyglot, 
So that's what SAP is saying about it. I'm not going to read it. Um, you can read it. I don't know whether you understand afterwards everything what is written inside. So in simple terms, it's basically the Cloud Foundry open source platform as a service with a number of tweaks and extensions provided by SAP. Yeah, okay. Um, I mentioned earlier, we have now the possibilities of uh, Node.js. Uh, we also have Java. Um, we can also embed any arbitrary language and runtime. So looking at XS Advanced, this can also be uh, deployed on a separate node and uh, separately installed. So the standard web IDE we have been seeing beforehand. There's of course also now a succeeding web IDE and this is running again as an own application. So this is how XS Advanced applications typically will look like. Internally, uh, you have a host name, you have a port. So this is the default port for the web IDE. And uh, here you can uh, develop inside and then you have the possibilities, basic HTML, uh, you can write analytics, you can write uh, a Java module and so on and so forth. <coughs> And in the same way, the same functionality, even though that SAP nowadays says for HANA 2.0, um, it's being deprecated. Uh, you can still use it uh, in the same way. So uh, we can write a new application. And uh, then, of course, we can also use classical XSJS. And this is just a proof of concept that all of the things I have been demonstrating beforehand still work on XSJS. Uh, sorry, I still work on uh, XS Advanced, um, and I guess it will be a challenge to, to look into the future how well the technology will be adopted uh, by customers and how extensively it will be used uh, within the SAP cloud environment. From a usability perspective, I can say it's quite nice because you just locally develop and you can easily push your microservice into the cloud and then you can, uh, of course, easily scale applications. So that's a demonstration again um, for, for cross-site scripting. Maybe this is a simple remark. Um, I can also say in the same way that um, you might know from the ICF, there's a, there's a blacklist filter on anything that comes in, but this is like super limited. So it will just check on all input values that come in via get whether there is a tag open slash script. And if so, the request will be blocked. So, I mean, again, uh, Chrome and, and uh, Internet Explorer, from my perspective, already take a lot of care, so to avoid reflective cross-site scripting, but um, yeah, that, that's a simple way uh, how attackers could still bypass this, and I don't see it as a bypass, it's, it's just, I don't know, a, a limited uh, functionality or a basic example. So, which brings me to the conclusions. So from my perspective, um, I like the idea and the approach of uh, XSJS personally because the API is uh, really limited and it's focused on what you should do with the database and that's uh, in-memory computing. You have access for, for traces, you can write down files and, and you have certain types of backend logic but it's not like um, you can then, I don't know, write fancy I.O. applications or stuff like that. I also like the idea that SQL injection is really um, also mitigated or limited um, by uh, the authorizations you assign. So that's, that's quite a good thing from an architecture point of view. Um, but on the other hand, uh, Let's just see where the road will go down because what I have seen at customers, um, of course, this is not like there are hundreds of audits I have been conducting, but um, again, from my past experience, what I have seen, what can go wrong, and we found the same things at, 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 at customers. Um, 
I think one of the biggest challenges for SAP customers will be the education. When customers will move from NetViva technology to HANA and HANA development, and when all the people that have been developing ABAP applications need to be educated in okay, need to be educated in um, in HANA development. So what I've seen from from um, the secure programming trainings I'm conducting. Uh, when I'm teaching the people how to securely program ABAP, um, I see that maybe just one-fourth of the people really know about the web technology. And now they will not only need to switch the language, or depending if you mix it up, so then you somehow need to communicate. But if, if they completely switch, they also need to, to understand everything that's related to web security. So that will be for sure for, for customers a huge challenge, and that's also something you can take into account when you do code review. Um, I think there will be lots of people who understand JavaScript, but that doesn't necessarily mean that those people will understand um, how SAP internally works, and that is also a huge challenge sometimes. So and in the same way, um, XS Advanced, I think that's also a nice way where it's, where it's going, but it's, it's, it's a really complex architecture, and uh, I think it also takes some extra time for the security researchers to uh, dig into this. <laughs> so you're smiling. <laughs> okay, which brings me to the end, and we have time for questions.